Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Federation Hall. I'm David Sequeira. I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery, and I'm also the person that puts Art Forum together. And um, before I introduce our speaker, I, I want to take a moment to invite you all to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the VCA or the University of Melbourne was considered that the Wunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation practiced song and dance here. They made paintings and sculptures here. They practiced ritual, they practiced healing, and these continue today. And it's with great joy and honor that I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So to our guest speaker, James Newen. James Newen mostly works with video, writing, collaboration and performance. He has a doctorate from the University of New South Wales and he was trained at the Sydney College of the Arts, the National Arts School and Union Docs Centre for Documentary Arts, New York. He has exhibited in the National, the Next Wave Festival, Ace Open in Australia and has commissions from the Sydney Opera House, the Australian War Memorial and support from the Anne and Gordon Samstag Fellowship Millenbuck Arts, the Australia Council for the Arts, Create New South Wales and Creative Victoria. James is currently working on Open Glossary, an exhibition with Chris Sue, Kate Ten Buren, Tamsin Hopkinson and Budi Sudato for the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art and Copyright Agency. And that will be, that's in August, is that right? September this year. Um, and he continues to present and develop both highly acclaimed and lacklustre work locally and internationally in places such as Footscray, Albury, Bankstown, Vienna, Berlin, Guangzhou and Ho Chi Minh City. Wherever you are in Zoomland or in Federation Hall, please make James Newen very welcome. Great, thanks for having um, me today, David, and everyone as well, all, all of your lovely faces. Um, yeah, so I guess um, this slide, uh, this, the presentation I'm gonna give today is going to be um, broken up in two parts. Um, the first part is thinking about decolonizing like cinematography. And then the second, which, you know, like, which I love because I really love watching movies because when I grew up, my parents didn't let me watch anything. Um, so, during the sound of music, they stopped playing it after they got married. And, and it was only like 20 years later that I realized there was another part to that movie. Um, and also decolonizing um, the mother tongue as well. Because, you know, language, broken languages, that's what I'm also into. Yep. so I'm just gonna play this short clip from um, Platoon by Oliver Stone. And, you know, like during the 80s and 90s, there was a whole bunch of um, cinematic representations of the Vietnam War. And I kind of want you to kind of like look at all the kind of like different cinema type language things that's going on here. The sounds really bad because I just grabbed it from the interwebs. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, um, having you know, like 
watched a lot of these types of movies about like what Vietnamese is, that kind of Vietnamese-ness and how Vietnamese people are represented on screen. I started to be really interested in kind of like Western and also like Eastern, you know, like cinematic um, histories. So like, you know, Japanese, um, Indian, you know, Iranian film as well. But um, yeah, and so I guess when I was doing my master's and after I just had finished my um, bachelor's, I was really obsessed with film. And um, in this shot, I'm just trying to kind of like perform like an aerial crane shot, which is usually what, like one of the establishing shots for like most movies that you see. Yeah, and that's my dad controlling the crane and also my mum holding the rope, which kind of like controls the torsion. And I was also obsessed with black and white film. So like Antonioni and, you know, um, Yasukira Ozu, because, you know, I'm fancy. <laughs> yeah, so kind of like um, when you kind of compare those two um, cinematic kind of like languages, like um, you see very similar kind of like um, thing to the camera. So you see kind of like the overhead crane or you know the, the helicopter shot. You also see kind of like the shadow in camera, um, there's, which is the aerial shadow, which comes up a lot in kind of like um, representations of the Vietnam War. There's also kind of like that tracking shot and the silhouette or the foreshortened kind of like figure in front of kind of like a, a background and to me like these these kind of like um really common terms or, or expressions in western cinema I, I wanted to kind of like um practice and perform so i wanted to be the god's eye view i also wanted to be um the outsider looking at the landscape um because in a lot of these films when you know you're representing kind of like vietnamese or you know the korean war or whatever war like the local population is always at a distance or you only get one or two love interests that are usually like a very pretty woman um and po possibly one character who's like a minor um enemy or bad character and so in making this and to kind of like really embody cinema and really embody the camera and the perspective of the camera and the director and, and all of that um i put I, I deliberately put myself into that kind of like physical moment and strangely to do so i had to bring in my family you know like um i couldn't do this kind of like crane movement by myself i needed safety and protection i needed my mum to control the spin, I needed my dad to kind of like lift and lower the crane. Um, he on the, as a side hustle works as like a scrap metal kind of person. So that's, that's where I got a crane from. But when I 
started thinking about this, I was like, oh, actually cinema is not about the self. You know, cinema is not about, you know, the individual viewer looking out into the world. And it's not purely about, um, you know, a, a director or, or a writer's perspective or, or, or storyline. It's actually a huge contribution that takes on a lot of work and a lot of kind of like effort from, from a team. And to me, like, that started to become really interesting. And I, I started working a lot with my family and a lot of my films and videos, because, you know, cheap labor. Um, I was just kidding. I split the, you know, the money. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so in, in this film to, to, to kind of like um, manufacture or, or confect that, you know, embodied camera view. I, I worked with my friend Georgia Brown. My brother was somewhere filming, but I never used his footage because, you know, he's a crap filmmaker. Um, and also, you know, the help of my mum and dad as well. Um, now, this is a much more recent work that I've been working on. Um, it's called Nam Biang. So I'm working in this with my auntie Kim, and we talk about kind of like forms of you know, like colonization, we'll get to it a little bit later. Um, also, I'm working with my friend, Leah Shreng, who's Cam Cambodian. And I'm working with um, Phil Solomon as well, who's helping me to kind of like reawaken kind of like um, these, these animations. So yeah, let, let, let's just watch it. Yeah, again, think about the perspective of the camera. បាទបានបោះហើយគំនៅនោះឡើយក្រែងពុំកំបាំងឲ្យចោលចិនទៅស្រុកក្រៅផ្នែកខ្មាំងទៅពុំកំបាំងរត់ទីទៅនេះយើ
and also Cham territory. Um, and it kind of like reframes that colonial narrative where constantly we're blaming the French, the Americans, the Japanese, we're blaming outsiders for forms of colonization, as opposed to actually looking at ourselves as, and also our ancestors as kind of like the perpetrators of colonial insult, of um, genocide, and also of erasing other people's culture as much as we have been erased. Um, the title Nam Dieng is actually like a, a funny word play. So Nam in Vietnamese is South and Dieng is like a voice. And when people say you're, when you're speaking in a Southern accent, it's Dieng Nam, which is an inversion of that. But also there's a term that's always been used throughout Vietnamese history called um, Nam Dieng which sounds very much like Nam Dien, but Nam Dien is basically our form of manifest destiny. It's, it's the, the translation of it is the Southern progress, which basically describes how the Vietnamese people from the North has progressively taken over the South and um, basically um, unified, not unified our country, but basically taken over the country and um, pacify the, um the barbarians down south and it's very similar to how we were pacified as well um yeah and and the thing is that really important in this film is how a lot of diaspora people tend to romanticize our ancestors and we also love to kind of like see our ancestors as kind of like tragic and victimized beings like we don't see them as human beings we lift them up to say oh look they, they were victimized we, we lost our languages we had all these things erased but actually when you dig in dig, dig deeper into it like there's this really unspoken about um histories of you know our ancestors being complex often very violent and often very cruel human beings and again i wanted to kind of like really disrupt the the perspective of the camera in this where often when you talk about culture and and um, ancestors and all of that like the camera is often very tight and it's all about intimacy whereas here when you watched it like the washing of the hair there is a really particular intimacy there but it's actually the camera is set between the legs of my auntie um, which is a real kind of like cultural taboo you know you're not meant to be sitting between or under the legs of an older woman um you know you're not meant like when there's hanging when when, when there's uh, clothes being hung on the line you're not meant to walk underneath pants because that's a form of subservience um the other thing is also the camera when it shifts it also shifts underneath her armpits um and, and so it's kind of like this thing where when you're thinking about forms of representation, you also really need to think about how you tell of a more complex story that's kind of like, you know, beyond, you know, the news or, or, or whatever you see out in the world. Like to, to me, that's, that's, that's more fun. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, like when you look at, and, and the picturesque kind of, um, the, the, the picturesque kind of like aspects of, the animation, like it, it's, it looks really kind of like almost romantic and otherworldly, but actually it's drawn from these nine dynastic urns um, during the reign of Emperor Ming Man. And these urns are kind of like really problematic in a way that's, that's not at all discussed about in Vietnam, like by the Vietnamese communist government or by this quote unquote like democratic free diaspora living abroad. Um, both sides love to kind of like think of Vietnam as a unified country that has always been ours, um, not as something that we stole and we killed for. And so these urns cast in the um, 1820s actually record landscapes, animals, creatures, of both the North and the South of Vietnam. So these urns actually carry that imperial ambition to record and rewrite Vietnamese history as something that's whole and something that's preformed 
and and something that wasn't kind of like um taken in a kind of like you know bad way um and and most vietnamese don't ever think about this you know like it's almost like most Vietnam, most australians don't really think about you know the impacts of colonization because you know of, of these kind of like really interesting imperial narratives that we're told and we're fed um <clears throat> On the other hand, the Cambodians whose lands were taken away by the Vietnamese, like we see them as kind of like these people who are uneducated, that, you know, like they their culture isn't as kind of like progressive as ours because, you know, we're more closely aligned to China. Um, whereas kind of like Cambodians are seen as like a lesser people. Um, the amazing thing though is that like after they were massacred and after you know their culture was stripped away from them and after their language and names were all changed under the under Ming Manx regime like they um let's see the venerable pitch and venerable chan um actually recorded these events and they actually wrote down and turned them into kind of like um spiritual buddhist chants just to encourage their people to remember kind of like these forms of colonization and exploitation by Vietnamese people. And so <clears throat> these chants, what you see here is actually a recording documented by ironically the French, you know. So the, the people who came in and colonized all of us because you know, once the Vietnamese took over all of the South, we didn't have enough soldiers to protect it. And when the French came to fight us, no one, no one was going to come in and help us to defend our quote unquote new territories because we had stolen it in the first place. And so it was really easy for the French, you know, in the 1840s and 18, up until the 1880s to basically take the country, right? Like we, through our own kind of like colonial and imperial ambitions, we weakened ourselves to the point that outsiders could come and take over all of Indochina. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and these um, bronze urns are actually UNESCO kind of like um, listed heritage sites. Okay, so yeah, so, so that's kind of like um, the first part of this talk. The second part is I'm gonna talk about um, forms of broken language and forms of kind of like thinking about glossaries and think about multilingualism um, for the show at ACA. Um, so I'll just step back and talk about, maybe, maybe I'll show this first. So I don't really wanna play this because it's actually still really confronting to watch the, the Rodney King kind of like beatings by the policeman at nighttime. Like, yeah, when, if, if you, didn't grow up in kind of like the, the 1990s. Um, this video footage is probably um, one of the first kind of like viral or public expositions of violence on black people in the United States. Um, what happened was that um, Rodney King, you know, was in a car chase, you know, he came, he, he came out, um, wasn't threatening, wasn't carrying a gun or anything. And then these four white police just came and just beat the shit out of him. And at that time, um, George Halliday came out with a handheld camcorder and he recorded this. Um, and what ended up happening was that the, the police were initially moved to a mainly white kind of like um, jurisdiction to have their their case heard and of course they were acquitted. And then in a national point of rage in the 1990s, um, you know, Amer like black Americans um, had the um, Los Angeles riots. Um, the only thing that happened in this moment in the 1990s was that a lot of the Vietnamese, Korean, Chinese, Asian Americans, um, who saw these things happening, a lot of them experienced kind of like um, losing their business, having their restaurants and small businesses trashed by riots, by black 
youth. Um, yeah, and so from this very moment of kind of like rupture, like cinematic rupture, I guess, with, with the recorded um, moment of violence, there was also a rupture between Black and Asian Americans. Um, where Black people to Asian Americans were always seen as violent, as, you know, destroyers of their migrant opportunity, destroyers of their small businesses, restaurants and nail salons, for example. And so leading on to kind of like Black Lives Matters in like, you know, the 2000s, um, this kind of like, racism between black Americans and Asian Americans still really persists like in a very kind of like um, silent way, you know, like there's a lot of young, hip, cool Asian people who are super woke and super pro black lives. But the majority of the American Asian population are still super racist against black people. And so in 2016, my friend in New York sent me um, this link, and it was a Google Doc um, written by Chris Zhu. Um, and Chris wrote a letter trying to describe to her uh, to their parents about kind of like why they wanted to stand by um, their black friends, you know, like why they wanted to stand by the protests and why they wanted to kind of like stop you know, police violence and brutality against black bodies. And Chris, not speaking Chinese or writing Chinese really well, wrote this letter in English, put it on um, Google Docs and then sent it around Twitter and asked their um, Chinese friends to help translate it for them. And within two weeks, this letter that Chris wrote addressing kind of, kind of like addressing their, their own familial racism or whatever, um, got translated into 50 Asian and minority languages. And I, and at that time, me and my, I asked my dad to sit down with me and help kind of like edit and translate the Vietnamese version. And from this small letter, a lot of Asian Americans and Asian diaspora, you know, throughout the English speaking world, a lot of us started to sit down with our parents, asking them for their help to translate these docu this document and also starting to have conversations about what it meant to be racist, racist Asians, right? Um, what it means to be kind of like um, always constantly finding our own safety in embedding ourselves within kind of like um, the white <laughs> supremacist structure that, that we're in at universities, you know, at school, at work, wherever we are, we always love, not love, but we always have to kind of like avoid racism targeted at us by aligning ourselves with white um, supremacy, essentially. And in talking this through with my dad, we also started to think through about kind of like, you know, black lives in America and black lives in Australia. And then that started for me, this kind of like discussion about racism everywhere, right? Like how Asian people are kind of super racist against, you know, like Aboriginal First Nations people and black people. And in this process, I guess I started to have deeper conversations with my family. And then I was doing this work for, um, next wave when I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was working with my auntie and my uncle at the same time. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. Like I, I have to tell you like um, before we do this performance, like it's really important that, you know as a public performance, I'm going to do the acknowledgement of country. And then my auntie's like, what the hell? Like I've seen you done these acknowledgements of countries before. Um, one, why are you always doing the acknowledgement for me? I want to do it myself. And two, why are you doing the acknowledgement in English, which is like the oppressor's language? And so I was like, what? Because, <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, she was really smart and stuff, but I didn't know that she had these kind of real critical insights. Yeah, and so it actually made me sit down and actually spend time with her and to have deeper conversations on, yeah, 
having conversations with your own family about decolonization, that's really boring and hard, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're Vietnamese or white or Italian or whatever. Like, I always find that I'm that whiny person in, in my family doing weird art shit, you know, like talking about decolonization and racial justice, right? And, but actually, if you give your family and people time and you sit down with them and you work together on a thing like translating something and kind of like trusting in your own broken Vietnamese language, which is mine and my auntie's own broken English, maybe we could build something together. And so in the end, we came up with this really simplistic translation of an acknowledgement of country for the show. And it's Doi chân thành cảm ơn người của Rungjuri và người Bun Gurung từ đất nước Khu Liên và các tổ tiên của những người ấy. Trên mặt đất này bị người khác lấy đi mà không phải nhường. Tại đây chúng tôi đã đến từ nơi khác để sống, làm việc và chia sẻ những câu chuyện ngày hôm nay. So basically because we used our super broken English, her, well, her super broken English because my English is perfect. Um, <cười> And also my terrible broken Vietnamese. This was the translation that we came up with. And in doing this translation, we had to encounter terms such as unseated. What is unseated? I don't know. I just throw it around because, you know, the people in the university are used to that term. But when I tried to explain unseated to my auntie, she's like, what the hell? And so in the end, the translation is basically um on the piece of land that was never handed away but people have stolen like yeah and i'm like oh yeah that's that is a pretty clear definition of unseated and basically it's like a really dumb simplistic moment of translation um yeah and also kind of like thinking about how we kind of like implicate ourselves as kind of like refugees seeking refuge on colonized lands. And so, yeah, this became like really important to me to have to sit down and have these conversations. And mainly it was um, through first uh, Christine Sue's Letters for Black Lives and also through my auntie's provocations. Um, yeah. And it's really actually interesting to think about um, you know, the theoretical kind of like thinking around kind of like gestures like land acknowledgement. And one of the um, one of the theorists that I really love is, you know, classic Eileen Morton Robinson. And Eileen's perception on kind of like institutional and kind of like, you know, um, performative gestures of acknowledgements to them are kind of like forms of it becomes kind of like these rhetorical performances or strategies that enact reconciliation that still kind of like sees indigenous people as the focus of the problem as opposed to part of something bigger. Um, and so for me, it was really important to think about what it meant to acknowledge the fact that I'm a colonizer on colonized country. And even in my own country, my ancestors were colonizers in my own homeland. And so it's really important to kind of like not think of, you know, the colonial problem as something that's, you know, for Captain Cook, you know, like potato eating white people, but it's actually something that's embedded in all of us, like as brown colored Asian black people, like we've all experienced colonization on both sides, both as perpetrators and both as victims, right? And to always constantly embed ourselves within the victim framework, that actually is kind of like a colonial containment. That's lame. Um, and kind of like thinking through language and, and, and talking through kind of like language with my auntie and stuff, I started to think about, oh, actually, when I came out to my parents, like I only had three Vietnamese words to rely on to describe what 
queer homosexuality, you know, a gay person was, the first was bong, which is kind of like um, basically an effeminate, you know, fishy man, like a Nancy or Pufta. And then there's also bede, which basically is faggot. And also it comes from the French word for pedastre, which equates faggotry with pedophilia. And so when I came out to my parents, like I'm like, um, so basically I said, mom and dad, I'm a bede person. And for them, when they hear it, it's like a bede is kind of like not a serious word. It's like, hey, mom and dad, guess what? I'm a faggot. Like, um, it, it doesn't explain that kind of like the seriousness of when you come out of the closet, right? Um, especially when that closet is overlaid with, a, you know, a Franco-colonial um, term, which sees kind of like, you know, like forms of any um, homosexual taboos as a form of exploiting, of, of exploiting, you know, like, and, and raping children, right? And, and so I never really thought about this until I had that kind of like translation moment with my auntie. And so I guess in the show, I wanted to kind of like work with Christine Sue to kind of like think through ideas of translation as a form of really putting yourself and putting your vulnerabilities into a moment as a point of contact and also as a point of exchange with other people. And so, yeah, and, and so kind of like classic James, one of the rooms at Ackers is going to be just like an Excel spreadsheet, lol. Um, and basically the Excel spreadsheet's going to have like a series of um, queer terms that themselves are super problematic because, you know, like a lot of queer theory and a lot of queer definitions are, you know, based and built from kind of like, you know, Western queer theory. And, and so thinking through forms of AI translation, so, you know, you put in the specific code and then it translate, it uses Google Translate to translate, you know, like white people terms for queerness. Um, but also sending this through kind of like my group of broken language friends to help me to kind of like translate it into different things. And of course, there's lots of moments of contestation and, and lots of moments of fracture and, you know, disorganization embedded in kind of like this really formal thing that we have to deal with almost every day and that we all hate the Excel spreadsheet. Um, yeah, and, and also, again, it comes back to that thing where language to me is almost quite cinematic. Like in a way it feels flat and it feels really overt and it feels like you're, it's like, it's an image, right? So to me, language generates images, but also the subtleties of, you know, like cinematography or, or forms of communication through kind of like flat medium, like film, like same, like to me language, like how do you kind of like make a super kind of like flat, Thing like that come to life and, and mainly like coming to life again it's that sense of creating and, and making things in a collective and collaborative way and relying and trusting in other people to kind of like make contributions that aren't destructive um, for kind of like the, the whole plan or the whole storyboard which you know I, I guess this is. Um, the other thing is that you know like talking to my dad about queerness and stuff you know, they're still super uncomfortable with it because, you know, they're kind of like middle-class Catholics um, that basically had to rely on their religion and their kind of like middle-class families and connections and networks to rebuild their lives again in Australia. Um, that's another thing that's not very talked about, you know, the privilege of middle-classness when you're a migrant or refugee. And so kind of like thinking through and looking at his very few photographs, like there's this kind of like recurrent um, motif of the white shirt and, and they're always popping up at, you know, like birthdays, Holy Communions, like all of these important moments. Um, and again, kind of like thinking through the white shirt moment, like I remember 
we used to have like this sewing factory in um, in Shipping Norton in Western Sydney. And basically we, my dad had decided to open up a, a sewing factory right in the middle of Australia's um, deregulation of the textiles and footwear industry. So not very smart. That's what happens when you don't speak in good English. You don't really understand the political um, risks that you're taking when, um, you know, of, of the society around you. So basically he had put all his money and everything into this clothing business at the same time that the government was um, deregulating and cutting all the protections for kind of like um, laborers and manufacturers in kind of like these kind of like lower quote skilled um, industries and sending it and offshoring kind of like this type of work overseas. So overnight, basically he had to compete. Well, my family had to compete with making clothes as cheap as possible and as quick as possible with kind of like Chinese, um, Vietnamese and Pakistani factories overseas. So it, it's kind of like really interesting to also reflect on how we talk about the economy is transformed like and who it benefits and who it most affects because without doing kind of like this kind of like really important moment of deregulating these kind of like labor industries um, Australia's economy wouldn't have been now aligned with things like mining banking um, property investment so so all of these kind of and higher education like so Australia's economy wouldn't have had the economic thriving or opportunities if, if you know, like the footwear and textiles industries were like still being subsidized as it was during the 70s and 80s. Um, but in doing that, like what ended up happening was that a lot of migrants who can't speak very good English, who didn't have very good, you know, like um, language skills, <clears throat> and mainly actually women migrants lost their income, you know, like they, they lost their ability to make, have employment and have some form of um, agency and some form of cash to kind of like build a, a new life for them and their children. And often they had to kind of like still kind of like maintain really kind of like problematic um, relationships with their partners because you know like they didn't have a job anymore and this is kind of like super normal for everyone right okay um and then the, the other thing is also thinking through you know like um yes th thinking through kind of like fabrics and the materiality of kind of um industry and 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 society like I started to kind of like research kind of um queer histories and there's been this kind of like really amazing gesture for queer resistance where um LGBTQI allies would you know spend weekends together sewing these kind of like giant angel wings um to basically block the um block the haters and so what ended up happening was that like um I started to learn about kind of like these really amazing strategies so I think it started happening at Stonewall where you know like you would wear huge outrageous costumes with huge angel wings to kind of like form like a, a corridor to to drown out and to block the visibility of um, hatred that's that's thrown at kind of like queer protesters or even people who are just like praying like um, you know like when the Orlando shootings happened like the um, the Westboro Baptist Church you know like mobilized and they sent in all these people to shout insane abuse at people who were just in mourning. Um, this also happened with in America with the Matthew Shepard murders, where basically the the family whose son was murdered in a profoundly brutal way was exposed to kind of like you know these crazy Baptists like churchy people, and so again like 
using this, this form of collective costuming to kind of like protect people. And yeah, it was really amazing for me to hear that actually over the weekend, um, the Rainbow Community Angels like came together in um, St Kilda to build like these kind of like wings to kind of like block the haters um, at Elston Week um, Library and you know allowed you know drag queen story time to keep going. Um, and one thing that doesn't really get talked about is that like a lot of the haters from these church groups, they're, a lot of them are kind of like ethnic people. So like um, people like people, yeah, people like from my own community and other communities who have come here, you know, with, you know, middle class or, or, or kind of like very conservative values and then seeing that the world around them is, you know, very kind of like opposing everything that they've believed in and they don't want their children to turn out like me. And so they turn up and, and they kind of like really mobilize and activate in ways that are really detrimental and challenging to kind of like the broader queer friendly community to kind of like encounter because it's like, oh, but if we don't say that a lot of these communities aren't supporting kind of like queer lives. Um, we don't mention that they're mainly kind of like brown or ethnic people and blah, 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 too difficult. And so I started to think back on how brown people during the 20th century organized themselves as well. Um, and one of my favorite, you know, like, um, artists of all time, you know, you, you always look back to kind of like your art heroes to give you that sense of, you know, like, um, not inspiration, but kind of like con connection, right? Um, and so for me, like, I've always loved um, this work by Lydia Pape. Um, and the work is called Divisor or Assembly Required. So essentially what happened was that um, after the after World War II, you know, like Brazil was in this amazing kind of like utopian paradise, you know, like they built Brasilia, which is like super futuristic, architecturally beautiful landscapes. But then I think in 1964, like the left leaning government um, suddenly were overthrown by a coup d'etat. And in that moment, from the 1960s onwards to the 1980s, like Brazil was pretty much, you know, like under kind of like a dictatorship. And, and you know, and artists like, um, uh, you know, Lydia Pape, um, Helio Autistica, Lydia Clark, they all kind of like produce kind of like um, small little collectives to kind of like resist this government. Um, or, or resist kind of like this kind of like super right wing kind of like control of populations. And, and in this work, what she did was um, Lydia um, cut up these sheets, sewed them together, but then put little slits in them and then took them into the favelas. And then children and people started to occupy these sheets and they formed like this amazing, beautiful collective mass. And if they were chased by the cops, they would just like jump out of it and then or, or find ways of kind of like escaping in kind of like really incredible material ways. Um, yeah, and so kind of like looking through kind of like art history and your own history to see and to seek answers to kind of like the questions that you're thinking about right now. And so this comes to, um, you know, the work that, that I've made before and kind of like thinking on how I might expand it at ACCA. And basically I've just been trying to collect white shirts. So this is for me spruiking. Um, yeah, if you've got any kind of like unused white shirts or anything like that, I would really appreciate if you send it to ACCA. Um, the idea is that, you know, like all, all of these shirts with all kind of like their bodily, you know, secretions and stains and stuff. Um, they are kind of like parts of our histories and parts of ourselves. And, and how do we kind of like shape them to make them kind of like connect together and, and how, how do we turn them into kind of like a moment of, you know, like intimacy and reflection. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the plan, it's a little maze. And yeah, that's pretty much it.
Thanks so much, James. It's um, so great that we've got a little sneak preview of the show coming up in September. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone has a question for James. Yeah, please. Yeah. This is just a silly question. But I was just really curious about the moment where you cut to your mother holding the rope and she's looking up. And I just wanted to know, was that all shot in one take? Or did you actually get on the tendency to draw the frame? Because I was just really curious yeah. about that exchange between your mother, because I was looking at that face and I was seeing something quite powerful in that gesture she was operating. And I just had to know if it was real. Yeah, so it's yeah, so like it's real, right? Yeah. Um, so I oh, it's jokes, but um, no, so like actually, like what's really um important that I really have realized when I make work from this is that you could have multiple takes, right? And each take will be completely different, but then you can kind of like smush them together, and then they're like, oh, it's a complete cool thing, but. Yeah, so basically the first shot here is, um, oops. so the first shot is basically the first take. And so it's like me going, am I gonna survive? And then the second shot eventually when, yeah, and the second shot is me like holding a camera. And then, yeah, and so I, I always had, in my head this visualization that I wanted kind of like that God view, right? That, that view that happens a lot in kind of like war movies where, you know, the helicopter's going ch -ch 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 -ch, and then you see the, the, the helicopter reflected back at you in the shadow. And, and I wanted to capture that shadow. Um, but then, you know, annoying mom steps into view <laughs> and then you start seeing her feet. And then in the end, actually like, I, I got um, my friend Georgia to be on site to help. And basically I just asked Georgia to kind of like can and track my mom because that was another camera movement, right? And I love taking long shots because like, you know, like I love, you know, like um, Japanese cinema, like, you, you know, like the, the Ozu settling shot, you know, that, that thing where, you know, you just let the camera gently move and just trust that things will happen, right? And, and so like, yeah, and so basically it, it was just panning and, and, and it wasn't even zooming in or out. And it was just my mom kind of like working the ropes, making sure that I didn't go too crazy. Um, and then at moments where she was like pulling on the rope, she was closer to the camera and then you got a close up, but then moments where she moved away and then kind of like the simplicity of of the building becomes kind of like almost that, that reference to kind of like early Japanese cinema, which is also like a, a Japanese representation of kind of like post-war life, right? And, and this is kind of like mine. So yeah, I don't know if that. I know this is really, I, I love that shot. <laughs> yeah, like the, the thing is that, the great thing is that when you're, holding a camera, you don't give a shit, right? It's just, you're just so obsessed with that. Um, but then you had the safety of everyone keeping an eye on you. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, the, the dynamic of, you know, like doing stunt work or the, the dynamic of, you know, like making a story happen. And it's always, everyone's holding the fort for you to stop the dam bursting and then you crash into the ground, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> when is anything ever solo, right? <laughs> yeah, like it, it is under my name, under the umbrella of James Newell. <laughs> but basically, like, again, it's this thing where, you know, you're allowed to be kind of like, you know, the eye of God or whatever, but actually always, you're always reliant on other people, you know, like you're always reliant on the support of other people. Like when, when I told um, a few of my friends that, you know, oh yeah, I got this, this ACCA commission, da, 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 da. They're like, holy shit. Like how the fuck are you gonna like fill up that space? That's 
like I would not touch that with a stick and I'm like well the thing is that I've got lots of friends and I've got lots of people who I have been working lots with and I have people who I trust and they're going to help me fill it up and one of the rooms is going to be an excel spreadsheet like you don't need to fill it up with anything special right <laughs> and I mean that was my question towards that but also I was just thinking while you were taking up the training and the narratives around your family history and like there's this really beautiful kind of like through line of like Yeah, it is. I think it's always about personal relationships, always, right? Like the only reason I'm doing art is because, you know, like my friends from high school got me nighttime painting classes and sometimes I put them into like performances and sometimes I ask them to hold cameras and shit for me, like when I'm in Sydney, right? If I can't find proper people to do it. But, but yeah, like... Yeah, it's, it's nice to say, you know, I, I, I collaborate with a wide range of people, blah, blah, blah. But actually, you need to collaborate over a long time. You know, like that moment when I collaborated with my dad was like in 2016. And also that took us, you know, four or five years until the point where my auntie and my mum started to open up about how in Vietnam, the coffee and tea plantations that our family had was actually free land that was given by the South Vietnamese government when all the northern Vietnamese refugees were escaping because the French were thrown out. Like, and I'm like, wait a minute, sounds quite familiar. Like after World War I, like all the Australian soldiers who came back home received land that they had to clear and turn into wheat fields, right? And, and my parents would never have thought about that or or told me those stories if it was just like a one-off collaboration on a train, right? Like this, this is actually built on years and years of kind of like really frustrating conversations of yelling at each other, of, you know, like my mum yanking on ropes, like, and, and it's kind of that thing where it doesn't just take collaboration, it actually takes physicality. Like you need to be with people, you need to do things with people and you need to sustain it for a long period of time. There's this kind of like weird assumption that collaborations are fun and that they're kind of like, you know, cute and you just like hang around eating kind of like snacks, but it's not, right? It's hard. And I'm like, and, and so like when you actually try to have these deep political conversations with your family, like you actually have to really embed yourself in it. You have to put your body at risk, you know, and, and that takes a lot of work and it's exhausting, but, you know, I like it. Yeah. Um, we're going to finish there. Um, please, everybody, join me in thanking James again. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>